I think we're about ready to go. This should be a, a fun panel, almost selfish panel for us here um, to record some of our history, to learn some of our history that we don't really know at um, uh, gathering the stellar group of, uh, of, of people to describe early Jubilee times. Just a, okay, anyway, so um, Dave's going to give us a little bit of the history about the club, the early days of the club, so that'll kind of yeah, frame it for us. And I passed out to them all these old programs so that they can have a little bit of history. I can even pass a couple of them out there. If you guys want to look at them. So go ahead. I mean, this is really informal. You guys do what you want to do. Uh, I don't know why they asked me to be here because I can't remember how to get home tonight. Like, it's alone what happened 42 years ago. Don't worry, your son just came in. Oh, okay. There's my grandson. Bring that, bring that up here, Mark. We brought some souvenirs of the early days. My wife, uh, Mary, has collected this stuff over the years. I'm sure it's, uh, there's some K.O. Eklund things. You could pass them around or look at it. Yeah, here's a, here's a shirt, I think from 1977, that's signed by Turk Murphy and a lot of other people, so, that my wife saved. It, you probably might be here. If not, put it on there now. Yeah, well, that's that's way way it. Yeah, was I here? I was for 25 years. That's the only thing. I'm just teasing. No, look on the back here. No, I'm teasing. It might be on here. I don't know what. I didn't read it all. So. I'm teasing. See if you can find it. Chet's on here. <laughs> here, of course, is uh, this is our. Uh, Bruce is on here. These are a few that have survived over the years. This is a gem here. This is uh, me and uh, my two sons, one of Mark, who's here, and his younger brother. And this was at the front row over at the Vets Hall, I think, during a High Sierra uh, performance. And if you look at the picture, you can see they're both sound asleep. <laughs> so you can see they were enthralled, you know. So anyway, I'll, I'm going to put this up here, and anybody that wants to look at it can, can look through it. So. My earliest uh, recollections of the club is that uh, um, before there were any sessions, we used to meet up in the security bank building up on Marsh Street in San Luis Obispo and listen to records. <laughs> that was the, that was the club activity. So that would have been 19 probably 1975 or 76. So uh, those are some of my earliest memories. How about you, Jeff? You got anything to say? Or Chet? Chet. I, yeah, I've got, I've, I'd like to make one comment on something that happened in the last group was up, up here talking. While they were talking, I had a whole lot to say, but I kept my mouth shut. But uh, one one guy said uh, the, the uh, heart of the jazz band includes a tuba. And they, he doesn't realize, of course, I'm almost old, old enough to remember <laughs> when it started. But... But in New Orleans and other places where this kind of jazz started, some guys got together and once in a while a woman, usually a piano player, and they worked with whatever they had. They had guitars, violins, a, a cornets of course, and tuba or string bass, sometimes neither. So there was in the beginning no definition of the instrumentation for a jazz band. It just happened. It was in the 20s when it got sort of stylized into what it is now. Yeah. And I got, a, I got a funny story that I just told Jeff about Dave over here uh, and, and your, son, your son, Mark. Well, years ago, when Mark was, I think, 14, uh, Dave asked if his kid could sit in with the Night Blooming Jasmine, and I said, of course. I think it was in Santa Barbara. I'm not oh. sure. And uh, so, so Dave, uh, an appreciation for my letting his son sit in with my jazz man, he gave me a bottle of his marvelous Zinfandel. And uh, I took it home and I put it in a special place so that uh, when nobody was home for a few days, I could drink it all myself. And we were up here at Pismo, I'm quite sure it was here, and the, my house sitter had some friends in for a party, including my son George here. I'll deny it. And somebody drank the, <laughs> some of the, over here's George, I thought, can't see too well. And, and uh, while I was up here, somebody drank my Zinfandel. I never got to taste it. Oh, well. Well, I got it at the dollar store, so it's all right. 
One of the first times the night bloomer, the night blooming jazz men have been at every festival here at Pismo except one from day one. And one of them, we had an opportunity to go on a cruise or a trip to Europe or something, so we asked to be passed that year. But that was a long time ago. We've been to every one of them since. And uh, er, in the early days, they had a lot of stuff downtown. And one of the places, was, I think it was called the Waldorf, yes. Yes. which oh, was yeah. a dump. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, so, my, my, there it is, the Waldorf. <laughs> And so uh, the, the, we had an interesting experience. My trombone player at the time uh, had to go to the restroom and he was a little upset because there were also ladies in the men's restroom. But uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> now, now it's legal, of course. <laughs> but, uh, and, and in the theater across the street or down a block, I'm not sure exactly, it was a movie theater which was partially defunct yeah. Some of the some of the chairs were missing, and, and it had, but it had a great state and had a good sound system. And the guy sat up on the top floor in the booth and ran the sound system. And little be known to the night bloomers, we were up on the stage and they recorded us yeah. in 1989 and again in 1991. And the only difference in the personnel was in 1989 our drummer was Tom Raftikin, and then he had uh, smoked himself to death, so he couldn't play with us anymore. And so we got uh, uh, Larry Koskis, and he played with us for the next 25 years. But they recorded us in 1989 and 1991. And Paul Reed down here and the sound man, whose name won't come to me, uh, got together and sorted this out and edited it and did a little remixing and put out a CD for the night. And it's, I still think it's our best CD because we weren't in the studio paying big bucks by the hour and worrying about everything. We were just winging it. We were up there having fun. You could hear crowd noise. And apparently, at one place, somebody, well, it was, the, the, Halloween was Sunday evening. And so people were wearing costumes already on Saturday. And, and so someplace during the program, somebody said, huh? And I said, Halloween, it's on the, it's on the CD, which may or may not interest you. <laughs> and uh, and then I, I remember uh, Dave played in the uh, Desolation Jazz Band with, along with uh, um, K.O. Eklund was the leader and it was a really good band as far as the trombone section goes and, and the rhythm section uh, I had, they had a tuba uh, I don't remember the guy's name, but Dave could Jack. tell you. What? Dennis Jack. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, the, the only clarinet player K.O. could find was Ben. Ben what? Ben Russell. Ben Russell. And Wee Wee Russell. He was, he was a very nice man and a so-so clarinet player at best. And K.O. Eklund told me one time, Ben has buttons on the clarinet he's never used. <laughs> <laughs> but... But they also had a cornet player whose name I cannot remember. Marty, yeah. Yes. What? Well, Marty. Marty. Oh, that was in the spot by. Uh, oh, the old guy. The old guy. No, yeah. this was. Uh, so which one? Charlie. Charlie, Charlie Bonner. Charlie Bonner. Charlie Bonner. Yeah. Charlie Bonner. Okay, so at any rate, the one, the one I was most familiar with somehow got my phone number, and he would call me up at any time of the 24 hours, three o'clock in the morning, and, and <laughs> wanted to chat for a while. And he he couldn't play by ear. He could that's read music all right. So yeah, K.O. Eklund wrote out his solos for him. And how I found this out, I heard you guys play some tune, and the next time he played the identical solo. And I said, I wonder how he did that. So I asked him, he said, oh, K.O. wrote it out for me, and I memorized it. I, on the other hand, can't read music, so there's either extreme. Yeah, we were playing in this very room where we are right now one time on the stage up here. And uh, it was a windy night, and all the windows were open because it was actually warm, that really warm that weekend. And a big gust of wind took Brad Ross' jacket right out the window, <laughs> right out the window. And uh, so we looked out the window, and there it was on the roof down below. And so, so we, so I went down to the desk and afterwards and told them what had happened. They said, "Oh, we'll get it for you." And sure enough, they sent some maintenance people out on the roof and got Brad's jacket, and I got it the next day. But that was an experience. 
Yeah, um, but there, we also used to have jam sessions in the early days at a place called Contiki, which I just drove yeah. by. Yeah. And uh, we were playing in the Contiki one time. I don't know, I don't think Paul was with us yet no. by then. And um, Paul played piano with me for 15 years or so. And uh, yeah. seemed like a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we were playing in the Contiki and Tom Rafficket was still our drummer at that time. And the waitress was really getting into our music and she was, let's say, scantily clad. And we played the St. Louis blues. And, uh, and uh, Tom Rafficket goes into a stripper beat. And I, I played the rest of that tune this way. <laughs> I, I understand it was a really good show. <laughs> But I didn't look at it very much. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let's see, anything else I want to tell you about? The, that's, that's all I'm going to tell you about the early days when we were here, because everybody else can tell you more recent things. Uh, I think uh, Pat Yankee and I are the two oldest people here, and I'm a couple of years older than she is. You have to say that. <laughs> uh, hey, Pat, we're still here. We're still, we're still, we're still, playing, we're still doing it. Yeah, we're still swinging, man, or lady. And uh, yeah, Let's see what else I want to say. Yeah. Oh, and, and again, the last group. How do you get young people interested in trad jazz? Well, first you have to define trad jazz. And up in the Sun Valley Festival, the festival director Tom Hazard wrote to me and some other band leaders and asked us to write a letter and define trad jazz. So they all wrote these things in and published them all in the program at the festival, the next festival. And I sent one in and some of them were very serious about the whole thing and defined it in minute detail and no two agreed in any way. And I, of course, if you know me well, you know I took it sort of lightly and wrote something facetious, which I guess most, more people read than the other stuff. <laughs> yeah, but defining trad jazz is virtually impossible. And getting young people into it, our jazz, I, I helped, and Dick, where's the area right here? Dick, Dick and I helped organize a jazz club near Los Angeles in Pomona uh, about uh, 1960. You know, I, I, was, I first met you about 61. 63. Let's Sorry, settle for 62. Way. Okay, somewhere along in there. And we organized a jazz club, and I missed the meeting where they picked the name. They named it the Society for the Preservation of Dixieland Jazz. What a boring name. I, I could have thought of something better. But at any rate, uh, we decided uh, in about uh, the early 70s, we decided to have a jazz contest with, with high school jazz bands. And I was in charge. So I wrote a letter to 150 high schools within driving range of, it was going to be in Claremont, the, the actual contest. I wrote to 150 high schools. I got responses from about 30 that they were interested in, which meant I would then send them the details and the forms and everything. I got responses from four. And that's because most of the high school band leaders and teachers don't know beans about trad jazz. Or care. Or care, right. And so, so, but four of them were going to come with trad jazz bands. It just happened that weekend, one of them was coming in from Palm Springs and the roads were closed, they couldn't show up. One of them, I don't remember where they were from, but they just didn't show up. Although they had, uh, the, we were giving them for that time pretty good money. Like first prize was 500 bucks. This was in, er, in the early 70s for high school kids. And uh, the second and third were 300 and 100 bucks. And, well, what happened was uh, two of them showed up. One of them was playing trad jazz, Claremont High School, the host, and they were playing fairly decent trad jazz, and the other one from Bonita High School, their arch rival, and they were playing better, but not trad. They were, they were more, way too modern. And so we had, we had some judges. I wrote down some of the judges here. We had Bob Havens, the spectacular telephone, trombone player with, with Lawrence Welk. We had Benson Curtis, remember him? Yeah. And Floyd Levin, those were the judges. I mean, we went first class. Well, they gave, they gave, they split the, they split the money between the two high schools, because one of them played better than the other, but they weren't really playing trade. So they just gave each, each whatever half of the total was. 
And, and, and while they were deciding how to do this, the night blooming jazz men played about 20 minutes. We were all there. And they gave us third prize. <laughs> well deserved, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I, I agree with a lot, a lot that Chet has, had to say. We were talking about trad jazz. Well, I was with one man who really knew trad jazz. That was Turk Murphy. And then I met Lou Waters, and uh, it was Bob Helm and Bob Short and all. Of course, Turk hated the word Dixieland. He couldn't stand that word Dixieland. And he hated the Saints Go Marching In. He said that song came in the 40s, and he hated to play it. But of course, it was in demand because it was very popular at that time. But I learned more about trad jazz from Turk. He, he taught me that I, all the songs that most of the Bessie Smith did and some other tunes, and he would never give me a, a, The only song I really liked that he gave me a long time ago was, and everybody copied, all the singers used to copy, was Was I Drunk, Was He Handsome, and Did My Ma Give Me Hell, that he did that, you know. <laughs> and I've been singing it, I still get, uh, 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 I still get requests for that. Uh, did, you, did he give you the original record? I've got the 78 from 1931, well, Lillian Johnson sang it. Uh, that, yeah, that's where it came from. Turk yeah. didn't write it. I didn't. No, say no, I know. I mean, did he no, give that, that came from to? a Broadway show. Yeah, and you know the story of, of that. You know huh. the story of the lady that they got that sang it in a Broadway show. She came out to uh, Hollywood. She was a starlet, and they were grooming her, and she did very, very well. She brought herself a new car, and drove to Santa Monica, and and shifted a gear, and she drove off the Santa Monica oh, no. pier and died. Yeah, that was Lillian Johnson. Yeah, no, I I don't know. It was Lily. Yeah, Lillian think, Johnson was the one on the recording. No, I know. Uh huh. That I don't was know her? the recording, but this was the the person that really sang it first. That was lady. her. Yeah, right. Oh my gosh, I'm trying to think of yeah. her name. Georgia White was. Oh, her different name. one. Okay. Georgia White was her name. Yeah. Well, anyway, I learned a lot about uh, trad jazz and. Uh, if I wanted to do something different, that, that was a no-no. You know, Turk patterned the band after uh, Louis Armstrong's Hot Five, Hot Seven, Jelly Roll Martin, King Oliver, and um, it, I mean, I really had an education in that. And basically, you know, when Lou Waters was the first one that came out, and I was part—I wasn't part of the West Coast Jazz Revival, but I'm—I uh, started with Turk Murphy in 1958, and. Um, I'm old, yes, I am. <laughs> when she was 10. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you for the nice compliment. But anyway, uh, people didn't realize that it was really Turk and Lou Waters and Clancy Hayes and all those people that got this revival of the uh, traditional jazz started. So I, I really had a lot to, I mean, I got a lot to learn and I, and I enjoyed it very much. He was like a teacher for me. And if you couldn't make it in Turk's band, you were out. That was just the whole thing with there. I don't have much to say about it, but I started my own band. I left Turk in 1962, and I was playing Monterey, and that's when I met Ben Russell. And he liked the band, so he booked me here in uh, Pismo. And um, I did quite well, but then I got, I got, I guess not money hungry, but I wanted the, more of the glamour thing going on. So, I got booked in Las Vegas and Tahoe and Reno and all those places. But then I came back when I did my Bessie Smith show in about 1983, and they booked it here at the Vets Hall. And, uh, oh, I have to say that I came here with Turk in 19, 1978, I think it was. Was it 77? When they had Pete Daly here? Because I was living in Southern California, and I remember I drove up. And the, I'll tell you that stage, you could only bring the microphone out halfway. If I don't know if everybody remembers that, you could bring the cord out, and you couldn't, because I like to take the cord and walk around. But you could only bring about halfway, and then sometimes if someone was in your way, you kind of had to lean this way and lean that way, and it wouldn't give any way that you know that any way you wanted to take. Also, I played the th I've here twice with Turk. And then I, I was here with my own band twice and did the Bessie Smith show. And uh, it, it was, uh, I, Pismo is one of my favorite, and I'm saying that from my heart, my favorite festivals. I like it because it has a small, and uh, sort of a 
friendly family atmosphere and you meet the same people and you can hardly wait to see them again. Yeah. You know, uh, don't you feel that way, fellas, too? It's like family. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, that's about all I have to say, but I, I love coming to Pismo and I, I don't know whether I can make it next year. God willing, maybe I will, you know. Maybe I always say, well, they'll bring me in with a gurney, you know. You know? So. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for having me here on the panel. Thank you. We had the, your party in here last night, and we didn't know what to expect. And it was packed and sold out, and it was wonderful. You mean that dirty material Bob Dragon well, I was doing? <laughs> he kind of tainted it a little bit, but I thought that the crowd and the atmosphere was exactly what we wanted. Well, it was a party time. It was yeah. party time. Yeah. Well, you know, we're doing tonight, we're doing it over at, pa uh, at my venue. At my yeah, venue. yeah, PJ. I'm wearing PJs and my moccasins. Uh, but anyway, we're going to uh, we're going to serve hot chocolate, too. Right? Right, Rhonda? I better check on that. All right, okay. <laughs> Okay, all right. I thought that was a wonderful idea, and the band is going to wear pajamas. I don't know about Bob Draga. I don't think he wears pajamas. You know? <laughs> well, anyway, it's a pleasure coming, and I, I really, it, Pismo is my very favorite festival, and that includes Sacramento and all those other places I've ever been. And, of course, the Hearn family has always treated me fantastically well. They've been my sponsors for many years, and I couldn't have nicer people to love and, and know. I'm, I'm the newcomer of this bunch. I, I made the second Jubilee. We didn't, we didn't know about the first one, unfortunately. Um, my youth band, the Fink Street Five, we're playing in uh, Southern California, and we'd applied every year to go to Sacramento. They started in, in 73. And they never called us. So on, in 78, we said, enough of this nonsense. We put the band together. We drove all the way up to Sacramento, and we played on the streets around the, the old town. Good for you. Good for you. And Wonderful. they noticed us and hired us back the next year. But however, K.O. noticed us and hired us for the 78 Jubilee. And I was very disappointed you weren't here, Pat, because I know you played the year before and the year after, but you weren't here the year we were here, which was 78. So you did 77 and 79. Yeah, that's when you had Pete Daly came. He yes, was yeah, Pete Daly, yeah. yeah. He was great. And um, it, it's just, I agree with you, this is the, the, the club and the um, festival. It's like old home week every time we come. Oh, that's right, because I get so, I, I really, I, my biggest thrill is when I'm coming up this hill after we're driving all the way from San Francisco, and you go up that hill, and all of a sudden, and if you get there at sunset time, you see this marvelous ocean view. And I look every year just to see that view. It's that fantastic. You know what I'm talking about, the view? Mm -hmm. And you come up the hill, and you see the ocean and everything. It's fabulous. Yeah, I don't know about the first Jubilee, but the second Jubilee, they had an, an outside venue, and we just did one. Um, glad to see them bring that back, but they would rotate the bands through Dave may remember it, they had a, a stage set up I think it was right here at the corner of Pismo and Oliver what, yeah. where the gas station is so yeah. that the local people I the, truck. the truck bed it was a yeah like a flatbed truck trailer that they would leave and The bands would rotate maybe they didn't do Turks, but us lesser guys They rotated us through that so that the community would see what was going on They had a big banner on the truck that said Dixieland Jubilee or something and and um, so the, the you know the local people would would see what was going on and hopefully attend. I remember Joe Derensburg played on that truck. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. You, well, you remember was it the Sea Cliff? Was that? Oh yeah, we had yeah. the Shore Cliff. Well, they had a piano there they kept for twenty five or thirty years, and it was out of tune all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it was out of tune. Not only that, on the side of the stage there was a board that was broken and it went down. You could see the floor, you know, oh. and nobody fixed it for years and years. And every time we came, we said, well, maybe this year they're going to fix it. <laughs> yeah, no. The, uh, we had Robbie Rhodes with us, uh, not 78, but in 19, the yeah, next one we well. played. Yes. And, and he, just, he just played everything a half step sharp. Yeah. He was playing in B and E and A when yeah. we were... You remember that piano? Oh, then. I do. Yeah, yeah I okay, gotcha. Yeah, okay. <laughs> How else do you deal with it? I mean, the band goes, band plays. Well, I sing off key. <laughs> <laughs> oh, golly. Such fun. Yeah, there was the short clip. There was the jetty, which is now Dell's Pizzeria. Right. There was the spyglass. Yeah, there was the Waldorf. The I don't know what the Waldorf is now. It was Shelley's last I knew. Uh, there was the theater. Right. 
and the Contiki that uh, he was talking about. Right. Yeah. I don't remember any others, but those were the. Oh, early. there was a Swiss restaurant. Oh, in oh, a Royal Brandy. Upstairs, yeah. No. That's not there anymore. Yeah. I don't. It, well, the building maybe, but the restaurant yeah, isn't. Yeah. German. It was German restaurant. German. Yeah. Yeah. German. Yeah. yeah. Old Vienna. Old Vienna. Yeah. Wow, yeah. I never yeah. knew that. Was Trader Nixon Contiki the same place? I think so. Yes. Yeah. It, it, yeah renamed. Uh, what I came up here in '74, I think that was the first time that I met Kale. And uh, I was, it was a wonderful relationship through the years. He had a, oh, the bulletins. They were just loaded with, with writings, Kayla's writings. Oh, oh the bulletins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The monthlies, right. These too, these are great. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Lake Pisbo. Um, so anyway, over over a period of time, Kale called me. He says uh, we're going to make our first album, <laughs> and uh, I said okay. And he said, well, "Can you come up and engineer the thing?" I said okay. So I got my name credit on that on the back of that thing, and he called me Paul Thumbs Reed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Kale. Yeah. Uh, now Chet. This this is I'm telling stories here, but this this is so funny. Got a call uh, to do a a gig in Santa Barbara at a country club. Montecito. <laughs> yeah, 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 Montecito, right? And so um, he said, "Well, maybe I." He said, "What do you think? They got a piano?" I said, well, "You better pull the keyboard out and take that up with you." Went, Thank God we did. We got up there, and I walked in, and I said to the guy in charge, I said, where's your piano? He said, it's over there. I walked over. It's a grand piano. It's a Steinway. It's a Steinway, that's right. And it's up on barrels, right? And the other guys in the band are setting up and everything like that, and I, I thought, okay, where's the pedals? <laughs> there were pedals, but... They were not working at all, so I, they set it up, and we played the first number. Chet counts, his off, counts it off, and he looks over, and he take it, Paul. And so I started playing. The pedals were not working. Every note I played rang and rang and rang. <laughs> That's right. Well, the pedal, the pedal wasn't working. It was detached. And same thing. So I, he looks at me, he says, take it, Paul, and I started playing this thing, and all the notes are just, you know. And Dick, Do I, no, it was you and, and Dick Donor, both, the whole front line, in fact, just looked over at me and like, what are you doing? I said, playing? <laughs> but, but it was, uh, you know, it was like a, a private joke. <laughs> anyway, then I went, oh, you went out in the car and got the keyboard. And then we were saved. We set that up. That part. <laughs> Just the other part. part. Now Patty, we used to be called Patty, and you still are. Never. That was my that grammar school name. Oh, okay. <laughs> but you were living like in inland. You weren't out to. No, I was born in Lodi, California, okay. and my father was a grape grower. You know. How I ever got in this business, I'll never know. I think I want to write a song called My Father is a Great Farmer, Great Farmer. I was going to do that, but I decided not to. <laughs> Lovely lyric. <Yeah. laughs> um, so any you call me Patty, it's all right. Okay, I like that. I've never <laughs> um, she called me up and needed a song for an album. I've had the pri privilege of being on her album as a composer. Do you remember the song? Did you like the song? It was very wonderful. I was going to say no. <laughs> I can't even remember the name of the thing. But Neither can I. <laughs> 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 
That's yeah. my ragtime man. Oh, lucky one. <laughs> oh, not. <laughs> but Floyd Levin, he wrote the uh, lyrics and you wrote the music. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It was never the biggest hit, but I enjoyed doing it. Good, I, good. It actually, was, it was uh, dedicated to his wife, Lucille. That's right. You're right. That's yeah. right. She wanted the song, me to write a song for Floyd, and which was this song. And, I'll think about the song about an hour later, of course, the panel will be over. There's nothing, there's nothing, something like I something would do without for... without you. Without you, that's it. That's the name of the song. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. without you. And I sang it, I think, at, at, in Los Angeles, and you heard me sing it. Uh -huh. And I think Johnny Vera played the yes. thing for me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I was part of the, the the group that started the Jazz and Babies in about '78, and we we of course got invited up here, and, and I was with Dead City Six, and we came to Pittsburgh. This was always the most fantastic festival. We would every day we couldn't wait to get here. About 1980, 79, we were there, and the Waldorf was the the place, a scuzzy place, but we played till all night long. And the High Sierra was playing. And so I arranged with Vic Kimsey that uh, I bought, I bought a, a bald-headed hat, a bald-headed skin hat over my head. And I you know, had a beard, so I looked like Al Smith. <laughs> and I, I, I worked with Vic Kimsey, to, and I said, Vic, we're going to do a, a little spoof here, and you're going to tell the crowd that you've discovered Al Smith's brother, who just came in from Australia. And we, we did that, and of course I, you know, I had the bald head, you know, skin head like Al, and, and Vic gets up, he says, well, we have a great surprise for you tonight. We've discovered that Al Smith has a brother and he just flew in from Australia. And of course Al looks kind of bewildered, and of course I come on stage, and we, we kicked off a tour. Anyway, it was a big, it was a, it was a fun evening for that particular tune. And that's the kind of stuff all the bands did with each other uh, and everything. And the last session was really interesting, but I, I, I like, like Chet, I, I had to refrain what I was going to say. Back in those days, all the bands, High Sierra, Professor Plum, uh, uh, Desolation Band, all the bands that we know, we were, we were hobbyists. We had day jobs. And all we wanted to do was to play. We didn't care about money. It wasn't important at the time. But somehow that got into the DNA of people who hired Dixieland bands and they think we all play for nothing. Well, we did back in those days. But we all had fun. Every band formed just to have fun. And I don't know how we're going to get young people because if young people don't have a job, they can't be doing this stuff. But we also had Shakey's Pizza Parlor. And all of us, almost everybody here, spent time at Shakey's. I couldn't wait to go to Shakey's to play with uh, with Hal, oh, gosh, uh, uh, Lutzenheimer, uh, Hal Lutzenheimer in, in, in uh, uh, La, La Mirada. They, they would, it's banjo and, and a piano player. Every night at Shakey's, and now Shakey's is an example. Young people today, don't they can't go to Shakey's. They can't go and... And, and, and learn to trade. And that's where all of us, hobbyists, we learn. I, I'm sure that if Paul played somewhere, I would have been there, because we, we sought it out. We drove, and that was success where we got our experience from playing in those days. So, But Pismo was always, and we played till 2, 3 in the morning. Today, I can't wait to go to bed at 9 o'clock. I, I, I drink water now. In those days, they had a pitcher of well, they had a pitcher of beer every, on every stage in our, in, in, for 30 years, and, and drinks and everything. Today, we're lucky to get a glass of water, but that's all we want and everything. But those were the fun days back there and everything. We got sent home every night with a full pizza. Yeah. <laughs> I put on, anyway. That's when I started putting weight on. You know, in the, in the late 70s, all the bands had badges. Interesting thing. Badges were a big deal in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, and they had band t-shirts and but badges. And about 79, 80, when Pete had his fire uh, and was badly injured, K.O. Eklund 
created a badge, and we, we tried to get a, a, a charity going for, for, for Pete. And, and K.O. Watson is so creative. His, his badge was, with Pete's picture, for Pete's sake. Oh, yeah. I still have my badge. And, I mean, how, how brilliant that K.O. Eklund was. I mean, it, 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 he couldn't, these, these things, these were the, were, were, that was the whole festival, just to read his stuff. Oh, yeah. Now, I have been looking for that one cartoon with Al Smith looking at Earl McKee. Earl McKee has obviously has taken his sousaphone and has blown it so hard it's straightened out and there's little springs and valves setting on the floor and Al says to uh, Earl McKee, hey Earl, I think you're playing too hard. See, I can't find that picture. I can't, I, I want, I want to, so if you have it, please let me know. I'd like to make a copy of it so I can do that. But it's in one of these kind of magazines and George Smith did send a word out to, uh, to people. It's got to be there somewhere and maybe, maybe it'll be here somewhere. I got one thing to say before we have to go play, but um, and Dave will back me up on this. The, the Desolation Band went to um, Sacramento, played up there, got back down here, and, and Bob Vincent said, we need to do a festival here in Pismo. And that's how the, the he was the instigator. He even took it over and started the whole thing. He did the whole thing by himself the first time with Kale's help. But uh, the Waldorf Club... And I don't know how long that we used that, three or four years probably, maybe more. Um, it was the classic pool tables, smoke nose level when you came in, the cigarette smoke was so thick you could smell, you could smell it a block away, the urine and the cigarette smoke. Um, it was just a typical sleazy bar. When we, with the Fink Street Five, when we were going in there to play, there was two little planters on each side of the door as you walked in, and there was some bum urinating in the plant as we walked past to go into play. <laughs> this is the kind of place this place was. Uh, just classic. And there's a little treatise on it here in this magazine from the 25th. Yeah, Kale wrote a, um, um, just a little treatise on that venue, and it's, it's hilarious. You've got to read it. It's just classic stuff. Um, he says all the all the uh, greats play there: Pete Daly, Nappy Lamar, Johnny Lucas, Jones, Jonesburg, uh, Garrett Derensburg, and all of our pals. He names all of the bands: Night, Natural Gas, Sierra, Night Bloomers, Fink Street Five, all of them. And it was uh, I don't know if they put Turk in that place. I would hope not, but it was a it was a, a filthy mess. Um, they had an old couch that was just shredded, you know, for people to sit on. Uh, a lot of people brought their own chairs just so they wouldn't oh, have okay. to sit on it. <laughs> it was a mess. Anyway. Uh, thank you all for having me. We have a set to go do. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for coming. I mean, what I learned was that it wasn't all bed and rose, uh, roses back then, that everything was pretty tough. Four roses. Yeah. That's true. So, and so, so uh, we made it through, and that everything now is kind of like posh and nice, and everything, every, you know, we're playing in nice places and everything. So we've done something right, okay? Right.